That's so I should be displaying my power in you. Good morning. It's Thursday. Welcome to the show. This is an example of God's power to direct the evil acts of men so that he achieves ends foreseen by the agents. <clears throat> Similarly, he directed that Israel, by the hands of the, of the lawless Gentiles, should crucify and slay the Messiah, who was given up to this doom by the, by the specific counsel and foreknowledge of God. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. So he made Pharaoh to stand as a conspicuous monument of his punitive power as long as the record is read. <clears throat> Moses asks, Who knows the power of thine indignation and of, the, of thy wrath according to the fear that is due unto thee? Psalm chapter 90, verse 11. How few take note of the certainty and, and power with which the divine indignation operates against sin. How few allow the truth to penetrate into heart and mind till it begets a reverential awe of God. <clears throat> Moses and all devout men wonder that God fear that men fear God so little. The power of God displayed in Pharaoh's case and throughout the revelation of his indignation against sin is an, is an essential element of his flawless perfection. Pharaoh resented the fact of God's wrath, just as much as moderns do, but the fact was brought home to him. Readers of Romans often skip the portion that speaks of the revelation of divine indignation, Romans chapter 1 verse 18 and chapter 3 verse 20. Consequently, blessing of justification is undervalued, because it is not remembered that by it we are saved from God's indignation. The prerequisite of true evangelism is the proclamation of the fact that the wrath of God abides on men till they, either, till they are either justified or forgiven. Grace saves from indignation. Preaching of grace that denies wrath is false and destructive. And that so my name should be published in the entire earth. The royal rebel was made an example. If God can conquer one, whom his power placed in the highest position, whom he maintained in life long after that life was forfeited, whom he hardened so that his every resistance was made to bring down still more punishment upon him. How can lesser men presume to resist God? God made his name known. Name reveals character. From Egypt his name is published in the entire earth and in all coming eons. Why does God want such a name to be published? Israel saw the mighty hand which Jehovah had put forth on the Egyptians. And the people feared Jehovah and believed on Jehovah and his servant Moses. And not only Israel, but the nations heard, and fear and dread fell upon them. Exodus 14.31 and Exodus 15.3 Rahab heard, and the report led her to believe. Joshua chapter 2 verse 10 the deliverance of Israel from Egypt was cited as the greatest demonstration of the divine power until the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Consequently, then, to whom he is willing, he is, hardened, he is merciful, merciful. Yet whom he is willing, he is hardening. This is a double inference drawn from both the passages quoted, and it sums up the answer to the question in verse 14 of Romans chapter 9. The repetition of he, he is willing makes it em emphasize the fact that God's will is decisive. He is free to act in severity as well as in mercy, but he is not free to be unjust. Were he not free to harden whom he will, he would not be free in showing mercy when he will. God is bound by nothing but his own nature and his promises. His is the only absolutely free will in the universe. That's God's will is the absolutely free will in the universe. There's no other free will except for, except for God himself. <clears throat> even, even Christ said, not my will. All that God wills cannot be mentioned in this passage without leaving the limits of the argument. Or we might cite 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. God could, sit, could have saved Pharaoh as he saved Saul of Tarsus. Had he, had, so, had he so chosen. Paul would not allow that either Pharaoh or Judas were the foremost of sinners. 
Yet God made Paul the chief example of his grace and Pharaoh the chief example of his indignation. Paul is showing that there is no injustice with God, for neither Moses nor Pharaoh had any cl just claim on God. He is asserting God's rights against Israel's presumption, and he puts unbelieving Israel on Pharaoh's level. They are hardened and calloused as he was, and yet a remnant had found, had found grace. Excuse me. Some of the reasons are given in the next chapter. It may be objected that God does not treat all alike. That is true. One hour's observation of men will prove that all are not equally privileged as to birth, education, social position, personal endowment, race, color, or health. At God's judgment bar, there is no respecter, there's no respect of persons. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Acts chapter 10, verse 34, Romans 2, 11, Ephesians 6, 9, Colossians 3, 25, and James 2, 1. But in the matter of election, God chooses as he wills. He places the members of the body, in the, in, body of Christ in Christ. He's the one that places them there, places every single member in the body. So God chooses as he wills without respect to persons or their willing or racing. In justice, he may give as much as men deserve. In grace and mercy, he is free to give without limit to those who deserve nothing but indignation. It would have been a great triumph of grace to save Pharaoh, but it was as great a triumph to show mercy to Moses when he asked for the life of the nation. He is hardening, is borrowed from the history of Pharaoh. Other words were used, which would be noted if we, if we were to going back of the present text to that of Exodus. Paul does not take account of all the facts that must have been in the mind of every Jew. Every mentioned Pharaoh, or having mentioned Pharaoh, Paul deduces a principle of divine action that applies to God's treatment of all the non-elect. God is now abandoning sinners to the hardening effect of sin. His treatment of Pharaoh has a voice for all because it does not differ from God's habitual methods. <clears throat> Moderns observe this process and call it psychological law. Paul says it is the infliction of divine indignation. The heart is hardened and made incapable of receiving spiritual impressions. Thrice in Romans, God is said to abandon men. Romans chapter 1, 24, chapter 1, verses 24, 26, and 28. These statements should be studied. For this God abandonment is apparent all about us. These people had refused to retain the truth they knew. Something quite, ter quite as terrible as the hardening of Pharaoh's heart is threatened in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. And there the reason for the infliction is three times stated. Subsequent parts of Romans will show God's reason for hardening Israel and visiting wrath upon the majority of the nation. But first, God's rights must be maintained. Paul is not just theorizing. He is after the manner of Nathan, saying to the unbelieving Israelite, Thou art the man. He is saying you are Pharaoh all over again. He put Israel in some class, in the same class as Pharaoh, whose sin was the persistent rejection of the messenger from God. Has not Israel rejected a greater than Moses? Like Pharaoh, Israel was hardened by the very mercy and long suffering God had shown. Chastisements had not turned the nation to God. Isaiah 1, 5 through 9. When grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, Israel refused them in their zeal for the law they had not kept. In the name of Moses, they crucified the Christ as a blasphemer and then refused to witness the witness of the Holy Spirit. If Pharaoh had witnessed signs, so, they, so had they. Signs, miracles, and wonders attested to these sign-loving people the message of God. 
Surely Paul sought to get at, at the conscience of this people by holding up the example of Pharaoh. Mercy and hardening are seen in God's present treatment of the nation of Israel, just as it is seen in God's treatment of those of the other nations. Whom he is willing, he is hardening, are terrible words. But put beside the words of Christ to the nation, and in them is filled up the prophecy of Isaiah, which is saying, In hearing you will be hearing, and may by no means be understanding, and observing you will be observing, and may, may by no means be perceiving. For the heart of this people is made stout, and they hear heavily with their ears, and they shut their eyes, lest that sometimes they may be perceiving with their eyes, and should be hearing with their ears, and should be understanding with their heart, and should be turning about, and I shall be healing them. This is in Matthew chapter 13, verses 14 and 15, but it quotes Isaiah. And this also from Isaiah. God gives them a spirit of stupor, eyes not to be observing, and ears not to be hearing, till this very day. Romans chapter 11, verse 8. Israel stands side by side with Pharaoh. One of the millions of examples by which the indignation of God is being revealed from heaven. He might justly have hardened any one of us. But he did not. He called us. We were chosen actually prior to the disruption. Chosen in Christ. And we were called during, during our lifetime. We were given a realization of truth. Given a realization of God and God's operation in the universe. So yeah, we were chosen out of the nations. Not the nation of Israel. Some were chosen out of the nation of Israel, actually, to be part of the body of Christ. But the majority, I believe, were chosen out of the nations. And we're part of that. We're part of that membership in the body. So don't ever consider yourself not part of the body at all. Because God has chosen you. He has called you. He made you, the, made you part of the body of Christ. You will be snatched away along with the rest. This is the thing. We need to hold fast to our place in Christ. And God placed us there as, as, as members of Christ's body. So thank you for listening. Happy Thursday. We will see you tomorrow.